It is now time for question period. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My first question is for the Premier. This morning, students and uh, parents across Ontario woke up wondering whether their schools will be open tomorrow and how they'll manage to make the day work if they aren't. It's already been a tough year for them, filled with disruption and classroom cuts. And after over a year of doing his utmost to pick a, pick a fight with teachers in the classroom, the Premier has fallen silent as parents and students face Ontario's first province-wide education strike in 22 years. Will the Premier break his silence today and say what he's willing to do to fix the classroom crisis that he's created. The question is addressed to the Premier Minister of Education and referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, the objective of this government is to keep kids in class. We are negotiating in good faith to achieve that objective, as we did with QP one month ago. Mr. Speaker, my message to OSSTF is to call off this needless strike. They have an opportunity to stay at the Order. table, to invoke private mediation, to work with all parties, to keep students in class. That's what our focus should do. The, the fact is, Speaker, we've been told so clearly that if the government of Ontario does not give an additional $750 million more million of your money, the taxpayer of this province, they will continue to strike. That is unacceptable. It's time we put students first in this province. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, it's time this Premier takes responsibility for his leadership role here and deals with the crisis that they've created. High school teachers and education workers have been crystal clear, clear about how this can be resolved. They want the government to back away from their reckless classroom cuts and reverse plans to increase class sizes and impose Alabama-style mandatory online learning. So if the Premier wants to de-escalate the situation and get back to the table, that's the simple solution. Get rid of those cuts. Get rid of that mandatory online e-learning. Will he actually do that? Questions from the Minister of Education. And Mr. Speaker, and also give a $1.5 billion increase to the second highest paid Order. teachers in the nation, Mr. Speaker. Okay. I'm going to ask the member for Waterloo to withdraw. Education, please conclude your reply. Speaker, the OECD put out a report recently which demonstrates that Ontario educators are amongst the highest paid in the industrialized world. And the fact is, Speaker, the fact is, Speaker, we're being reasonable with the taxpayer of this province. We're offering a $750 million increase. We think that's fair. We also believe, Speaker, that students should not be in the middle of this discussion. What they should do is call off the strike. What the OSSCF should do is stay at the table and invoke private mediation without precondition. The final supplementary. Well, with all due respect, Speaker, the Premier needs to respond to the concerns of Ontarians in this regard. Teachers are not the only ones opposed to these cuts. Parents made it clear that they don't want their kids forced into online learning courses that won't work for them. Students marched out of schools across Ontario to protest larger class sizes and fewer course Order. options. The Premier has no mandate to make these cuts, Speaker. No one in our schools has asked for them. Why is he so determined then to impose these cuts? Minister to reply. Speaker, the Premier is determined to keep kids in class. That's why we have been negotiating in good faith. It's how we got a deal with QP just one month ago. Mr. Speaker, the government of Ontario is offering a $750 million increase to educators in this province who we value. Speaker, what we're, being, what we're told by OSSCF is that if we do not give them an additional $750 million more dollars of tax dollars, I'm told, we're told, that they will strike again. That is totally unacceptable to this government. We are being reasonable. We're trying to put set students at the centre of this discussion. It's why, Speaker, we've increased investment by an additional on track to spend an additional $1.2 billion more this year than last year in the defense of public education. My message to OSSTF is clear. Cancel this needless strike. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier, but I can tell you if the Premier is determined to solve this crisis, he knows very well what he needs to do, and he needs to stand in his place today and let the people of Ontario know that he has a real serious uh, desire to fix the mess that he's created. Students and their parents have already dealt uh, with a lot uh, this year. They've seen courses vanish before their eyes. They've seen classes growing in size. They've even learned that 
that water in their schools might not be safe to drink. The Premier can't hide from this Speaker, especially after doing so much to create the conflict that we're seeing today. So I'd like to hear from the pr Premier directly. What steps is he willing to take to bring people to the table and solve this crisis? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Order. Speaker. Speaker. The government, the step we're asking OSSTF to accept without precondition is private mediation, and every member of this legislature should be encouraging them to do so. They should not have striked last Wednesday knowing that that tool remained the toolkit. Mr. Speaker, Statistics, Canada, Statistics Canada today put out a report, and what it said is salaries for Ontario public teachers with 10 years of experience are amongst the, hi amongst the, highest, the highest in the nation, $10,000 more than the average Canadian. Mr. Speaker, we have been reasonable, offering a $750 million increase. Order. To teacher pay. And the fact is, what we're hearing is if we do not accept an additional $750 million of tax dollars, they will strike again. That is unacceptable, and it's time we put students first in this province. Well, Speaker, I'm going to attempt to go back to the Premier. For weeks, the Ford government has focused on dodging blame and scoring points in the press when they should have been focused on kids in the classroom. Elementary teachers were forced just yesterday to correct the education minister when he claimed that he was laser-focused on bargaining while they were actually waiting a week between bargaining dates. Wow. Why is the government more interested in organizing press conferences and dodging blame than actually finding a solution? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the focus of the government is to keep the children of this province in class. We've been negotiating good faith. It's how we got a good deal with QP that ensured students remain Order. in positive learning environments. Speaker, the priority of the government is to keep focus on our students. It's why in the last economic statement we announced an additional $200 million more million in the defense of public education. Mr. Speaker, let the facts be part of this discussion. Since 2003-04, there are 12 per cent more educators in this province and less than 1 per cent more students. Speaker, we have invested in education. We are offering a $750 million reasonable and fair increase to our educators, some of the best educators in the world. Mr. Speaker, what we're told is if we don't give another $750 million more, they will strike. This is $1.5 billion. We think that's unfair to the, to the, teacher, to the students of this province, Bonds. and I'm urging OSSTF to work with us in good faith and cancel this strike. The member for Hamilton East Stony Creek has to come to order. Final supplementary. If the focus of the government is to keep kids in the class, their strategy has been nothing short of an abject failure. Right. This comes down at the end of the day, Speaker. This comes straight down to leadership, and the buck stops with the premier of this province. He can't sit silently and hope that this all goes away. Teachers have been clear that we can avoid a strike tomorrow if the premier reverses his plans for classroom sizes to increase and reverses his plans for M Alabama style mandatory online courses. So will the Premier actually Order. show some leadership here, stand in his place today, and say that he will do that, Speaker? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition left out another uh, element of their top three priority list, a $1.5 billion request or demand on the taxpayer of this province. If we give them that, if we give an additional $750 million more to the taxpayer paid by the taxpayer, then they will consider private mediation, not even get a deal. Mr. Speaker, that's unacceptable, yeah. and parents are demanding every member of this legislature to stand up against escalation. We believe, we believe Speaker, that OS SSTF should cancel this needless strike, should stay focused on our students, should remain focused on keeping them in class. That's what we're going to do every single day. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, thank you. My next question is also for the Premier, but I think the government needs to realize that nobody, nobody trusts their numbers. They have not been very good with having trustworthy numbers. Look, the former environmental commissioner, the, office of the legislature, officer of the legislature who used to provide independent research on the environment before the premier fired her, has joined the auditor general in slamming the Ford government's made-to-fail climate change plan. She described the premier's defense of the plan as complete nonsense. Huh. Does the premier think that she should also wait until 2030 before offering her opinion? Questions to the premier. My house leader. Referred to the government house leader order. Thank you, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the uh, the question. What the uh, Auditor General did say was that this government remains on track to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. That's actually really good news for the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. I, obviously, we thank the Auditor General for her work. She also did highlight that the plan needs to make there needs to be some improvements in the plan. The minister himself has said that this is a living, breathing plan that will change as circumstances change. Just last week, the Premier announced that uh, Ontario, uh, New Brunswick and, uh, and Saskatchewan would, be, would partner up in SMR in, in expanding SMR technologies. That's also good news. That wasn't in the original plan, but it's good news. We're talking about transit and transportation. We're on track because the Premier has made this a priority. He has said we will meet our targets he said that to our caucus and to our cabinet, Mr. Speaker. We will meet our priorities, Fox. and we ask the opposition to help us to do that. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I'm going back to the Premier on this question. At a time when the world is coming together to confront the climate crisis and the stakes could not possibly be any higher, Ontario's Premier is not just defending a plan that is accurately described as not based on sound evidence, but then telling people demanding urgent action that he won't listen to them until 2030. So I'm asking the Premier directly, why is he dragging Ontario backwards exactly when the rest of the world is moving towards action on climate change? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, this government and the previous uh, Ontario governments have always been leaders when it comes to the environment. We're leading the nation in terms of our GHG yes. reductions emissions. Uh, we're at 22.5%, and the Premier has said very clearly we will meet our targets. But let's look at what the NDP have to offer. They said that they want to offer a new, uh, a new, new Green Deal, but not till 2022. We're making progress right now with our Ontario Made in Ontario Environment Plan, Mr. Speaker. What else do Opposition we have on the table? They say that we have to take urgent action on floods. But what do they have on the table? Nothing. We have on, on the table, we refocus the conservation authorities, Mr. Speaker. They said they wanted to talk about species at risk and extinction, but what do they put on the table? Nothing. Mr. Speaker, on every single point, they're telling the people of Ontario to wait till 2022. Us? Probably why they've only won one election since Confederation, Mr. Speaker. Next question, the member for Markham Union Bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, we have spoken before about the need to unite this country economically. You have said previously what is good for Ontario is good for Canada and vice versa. You even put this word into action recently in your leadership role at the Council of the Federation meeting, demonstrating how our province should be working together against the world and not competing against each other. Even the Governor of Bank of Canada, Stephen Polos, was recently quoted in Globe and Mail saying that, quote, there are so many fronts on which federal-provincial collaboration would be better." Unquote. Premier, can you speak to the Legislature more about the importance of ending inter-provincial trade barrier and the positive impacts that they will have for all Canadians? Thank you. Questions to the Premier. To you, Mr. Speaker. Start the clock. Premier to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the opposition for the standing ovation. I know they've been doing a great job. Thank you. I also want to thank our great all-star MPP from Markham Unionville, but I want to give a special shout out. I want to give a special shout out to Bluer Collegiate. I met the students downstairs. They have a bright future under our government. They don't have to worry. 
Mr. Speaker. They can go home and tell their parents Response. they don't have to worry about the high taxes they've seen over the last 15 years. They don't have to worry about the 300,000 jobs the previous government and the NDP ran out of this province because our province is booming. People are. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. But my question is back to the Premier. Premier, those are very powerful comments by Governor Polos, who is the many of respected economic voices of this country on this issue. But Canada and Ontario do not work in isolation, and we are impacted by the global economic communities and their impressions. Premier, you were recently in Washington and experienced the first-hand uh, important role and impact that the international finance market have on Ontario and Canada's trade re regulations. Premier, can you elaborate on what the international economic community has said regarding the impact that interprovincial trade is having on Ontario and even Canada? Thank you. Premier. I thank our great MPP for that question. Yes, I, we had a great meeting, by the way, of the premiers, making sure that we have a nation that is united, not divided, like we saw after the last election. Every single premier left here feeling positive, having a little bit of certainty that they can bring home to their province. We discussed interprovincial trade that's $50 billion sitting on the table to make sure that each province can trade freely amongst the country. My, my, Mr. Speaker, it's easier to trade with the United States than it is uh, amongst the provinces, but we're going we're gonna to fix that. We had a great meeting in Washington, met Governor Hogan, and for the first time, U.S. governors are coming to Toronto. Our, our province is thriving. We're the envy of North America right now. The envy of North America. He couldn't believe that we were doing $390 billion a year in trade, two-way trade with the United States, Mr. Speaker. Again, prosperity is here in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, we learned that this government is appealing a ruling that overturned their attack on post-secondary students, universities, and college campuses across the province. The courts were clear, Speaker. This government's terrible policies were struck down as a huge overstep by the government. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier abandon his unnecessary appeal and stop wasting taxpayer dollars with yet another losing lawsuit? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Oh. Referred to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Order. Mr. Speaker. Our government is com committed to ensuring that tuition is affordable for all students in Ontario. We've spoken about this for a very long time, Mr. Speaker, back to the time of our election. We wanted to make sure that people had more money in their pockets. We wanted to make sure that education was affordable for all students. That is why we took the measures we took, Mr. Speaker. Measures to reduce people's costs for tuition. Measures like the Student Choice Initiative, which were geared towards making sure that students have a choice with respect to what they spend their money on. Here, here. That was all it is about. As the process is presently under an appeal, it would be inappropriate to comment on the details of the matter at this time, Mr. Speaker. But again, we reiterate Aunts. the importance of ensuring that our students have access to affordable education. That's what we want to ensure, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, well, I think that students and the courts were pretty clear about this government's decision, and the damage has already been done. We've seen campus food banks closed. Spaces for LGBTQ students, racialized students, and women closed. Campus life has been disrupted. This government's attacks and cuts on education are hurting students, both in the elementary school sector and in post-secondary education as well. Instead of going to court and trying to tear uh, universities and colleges down, we should be investing in them, Speaker, in world-class education that students and families in this province deserve. Instead of taking our students to courts again, will the Premier stop his attacks and restore the funding for the campus programs he has forced to close. Again, the Minister of Colleges and Universities to reply. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. I'm happy to stand up and speak about the great things our government is doing to ensure that students have access to affordable education. 
and I am proud of the system that we have in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. When students from around the world want to come to Ontario to get an education, that is an incredible, incredible testament to how outstanding our universities are and our colleges are in Ontario. Our Order. brand is recognized worldwide. We want to ensure, though, that our students can access that education and that it is affordable for them. That is our goal. That is why we made the initiatives we made towards OSAP, ensuring that it was sustainable for future generations. It was clear, listen to the Auditor General, the system was falling apart. It was unsustainable. We are making Response. sure that it's sustainable for future generations. We've provided a 10 percent reduction in tuition. We've done a number of things, and we will continue to do things to make school affordable for our students. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the FAO's report showed that over the next five years, this government plans to spend 10 percent less on programs and services. That's $1,070 less per person. Mr. Speaker, since this government took office, we have seen a rise in homelessness, in poverty and reliance on food banks. Ontarians are increasingly dependent on precarious work. We know that many young people are working in the gig economy and that stagnation, stagnation of wages is hurting, which has left many people feeling hopeless and helpless. Mr. Speaker, how can this government justify and deprive Ontarians of the programs and services that they need and that their lives depend on? Why are you cutting to create efficiencies that are harming people? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Finance. Referred to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I thank, thank the member for the question and I again thank the FAO for, uh, for his incisive uh, review of the situation in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, because of the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, we found ourselves in a very, very challenging financial situation, and that's exactly what the FAO pointed out. That's why we've been balancing, Mr. Speaker, three priorities. The priority of investing in critical services. we have spending more on health care, $1.9 billion more. More on education, $1.2 billion more. Mr. Speaker, we're putting money back into the pockets of Ontarians, $3 billion more, by getting rid of the cap-and-trade carbon tax and adding the, uh, the other advantages we've had for individuals and families. And, Mr. Speaker, we're also making sure that we are on track to balance the budget by 2023. Mr. Speaker, three priorities that the previous government ignored, the priorities of Ontarians, Response. the priorities we were elected on. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, this government's priorities are out of whack. Across this province, there are children going to school hungry, and people are living in substandard homes that can't afford heat. I recently heard from a young person who grew up in rural Ontario that when he was in high school, a friend of his did not always go to school, as his parents were scared that Children's Aid would take their son if he went to school unfed. Mr. Speaker, Tis the season of giving. Instead, this government has taken away services. This holiday season, many Ontarians will be deprived of food, of shelter, of warmth because of this government's reckless cuts. Not just cuts to services, but now the Question. FAO has pointed out that they are planning to cut revenues, which will further starve program expenses. Will you tell this House which programs you plan to cut to keep your promise of cutting tax? Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister to reply. Minister, as, as I said before, increases in health care, $1.9 billion, increases in education, $1.2 billion. But, but the member from scarborough -Gilgrid, it's, it's, you know, we put in place one of the most progressive tax reductions, the low-income tax credit. It's going to affect 1.1 million Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. 580,000 people working on minimum wage are going to be taken <coughs> off of the tax roll. But the member from scarborough gilwood and the members of the opposition voted against that, Mr. Speaker. They voted against a child care tax credit that's going to be putting money into the pockets of the very people that she purports to be supporting. Mr. Speaker, I think it's time for the opposition and, frankly, for the, for the members of the uh, Independent Caucus to think seriously about what needs to be done to help low-income families to help all Ontarians not just create over 250,000 jobs, Order. but support them in the way that this government is supporting them to make sure that affordability is at the top Response. of the agenda for this government. The next question, the member for Oakville North Burlington. 
Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. I hear from constituents all the time who have had to deal with the legal system and ask why their experience could not have been easier, faster, and more affordable. They wonder why the need to hire someone to manage matters that seem simple, only to find out just how complex and outdated the court system is. And the Auditor General's report outlined the same concerns about the slow and antiquated nature of our justice system. Speaker, can the Attorney General tell us what our government is doing to improve and modernize the way our justice system works to make it simpler, faster, and more affordable for people to access justice? Questions addressed to the Attorney General. Thank you to the fantastic member for the question. And Mr. Speaker, there is no question that we inherited a badly neglected and overly complicated justice system, neglected by the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP yep. government. We agree with the Auditor General, Mr. Speaker. And we've heard loud and clear from people across Ontario that the justice system has grown too complex and outdated and needs better support. We need to support the growth of safer communities, Mr. Speaker. We need to stand up for victims of crime, Mr. Speaker. We need to stand up for law-abiding citizens. And that's why I was proud to table the Smarter and Stronger Justice Act yesterday, a bill that proposes over 20 smart and sensible reforms that will make Ontario's justice system work better every day for law-abiding citizens, consumers, businesses, and it'll make our communities safer while getting tough on crime to ensure criminals aren't profiting from their own illegal activity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, speaker, I think we can all agree that crime should not pay. When the Civil Remedies Act was first created in 2001 by the Progressive Conservative government, it was an innovative, crime-fighting piece of legislation intended to and successful in deterring unlawful activity. This act allows police to seize property and funds used in or gained from illegal and criminal activity and redirect it into the hands of victims and police programs that fight crime. Unfortunately, while Ontario was once at the forefront of civil forfeiture rules, our province now lags far behind other jurisdictions that have updated their forfeiture laws. Criminals have taken notice, Speaker. Can the Attorney General tell this House what he is doing to address this growing problem? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the insightful member from Oakville North. She's absolutely right. The member is absolutely right. Our province's civil forfeiture laws, along with our province's entire justice system, were left neglected under 15 years of Liberal governments. Their focus was elsewhere, I don't know where, and they weren't ensuring justice system kept up with criminal activity. Mr. Speaker, we are the first government to take on the important work of modernizing our laws around civil forfeiture so Ontario can support victims and frontline police officers by making it harder for criminals to hold on to the proceeds of their own legal activity. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I introduced the Smarter and Stronger Justice Act into this legislature, and in the Act are reforms that, if passed, will simplify the process to see those proceeds of crime, allowing funds to be redirected faster and more efficiently to victims and support programs that fight crime. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Next, we have the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, this Conservative government confirmed that the 30 per cent cut to legal aid Ontario will be made permanent, a cut that threw the legal community into chaos undermined access to justice to the lowest income Ontarians and put in jeopardy specialty clinics like the ones that serve injured workers. Why is this Premier plowing ahead with cuts that will hurt Ontarians, clog our court systems and cost taxpayer dollars more in the end? Questions addressed to the Premier Attorney General. and referred to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After years of Liberal mismanagement supported by the NDP, legal aid was left in an unaccountable, unaccountable, unsustainable path that jeopardized the needs of the most vulnerable clients where and when they needed it the most, Mr. Speaker. Our government took immediate steps to consult widely across the province with those who are providing the service, those who are receiving the service, clinics, private pay lawyers, duty counsel, judiciary, lawyers across the system, stakeholders, vulnerable, vulnerable victims groups. Mr. Speaker, we consulted with everybody and we came up with a plan that will modernize legal aid for the first time, the first time since 1998 when it was brought in. 1998 was the year that Google was incorporated. It was before the first BlackBerry, Mr. Speaker. It had not been touched for that long, Mr. Speaker. And 
We have modernized legal aid. I'm so proud to stand behind it. We put it on a path to sustainability, Response. accountability, and to serve the people of Ontario, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, only this government would have the gall to celebrate not cutting legal aid a further $31 million at the same time as announcing that the $133 million that they already have cut will be made permanent. Yesterday, the government ta tabled omnibus legislation that is yet another attack on Legal Aid Ontario. The bill tears away the words access to justice and low income from anything to do with legal aid services. Wow. But, Mr. Speaker, that is exactly what legal aid is supposed to do provide access to justice to low income Ontarians. Why is this Premier setting up low income people to fail in our justice system? The Attorney General again to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you what our government has done is we have gone out and talked to the people who operate in the system. We have heard the people in the system who are Order. receiving the service, and each year we increase the eligibility by 6 percent, Mr. Speaker. We're expanding eligibility year over year over year, Mr. Speaker. We want to make sure that these programs are available for those who need them the most in the form that they need them, whether it be duty counsel within the courts, whether it be private pay lawyers through certificate programs, making sure it's working better. We want to make sure the clinics are sustainable. They're the foundation. They're part of the three pillars of, of legal aid, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that. We want to put them on a path of success to provide services where and when they need it the most, Mr. Speaker. Now, the challenge I have, Mr. Speaker, is and when we get into facts. When we get into facts, it's very difficult to have a conversation with those who are not fully Us. aware of the facts, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, after the press conference, the member from Brampton East stood up and said that our moves have closed clinics. I challenge the member from Brampton East to mention one clinic that is closed under our watch. Thank you. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. My question is to the hardworking, caring, and compassionate Minister of Health. <laughs> Speaker, across Ontario, we're fortunate to have some of the finest health care professionals dedicated to delivering the highest quality here, care. Here. Here, here. But we all know our health care system is facing capacity pressures, and patients and families are getting lost in the health care system. They're falling through the cracks, waiting too long to get the care they need. That's why our government made a commitment to fix Ontario's public health care system. The minister has been very busy over the last two weeks announcing the next step in making our commitment a reality. Can the minister please tell Question. this House more about what she's been focused on over the last two weeks? Questions to the Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Chatham, Kent Leamington, for the question and the great work he's doing in his community. Speaker, our government made a commitment to the people of Ontario to build a sustainable and connected public health care system and to end hallway health care. As a key component of our plan, we've announced the first series of Ontario health teams. These 24 teams will better support patients and families by connecting care providers to work as a single team. In doing so, Ontario health teams will create a seamless experience and better transitions for patients through our health care system. Each individual team will create a local health care system that provides coordinated care for patients, reduces wait times, and leads to better health outcomes for patients. This model provides an opportunity for frontline health care professionals to do the work that they do best, delivering excellent quality patient service. The supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for delivering on our government's commitment. Here, here. It's so great to finally see this much-needed change become reality within our health care system right here in Ontario. As we finally break down the long-standing barriers that have prevented care providers from working directly with each other to support patients throughout their health care journey, the patient experience will be greatly improved, and navigating the health care system will be easier and more convenient. I know the people in my riding of Chatham-Kent-Leamington 
are thrilled to have an Ontario health team and are excited to enjoy the benefits that having one will provide them. Yep. Speaker, as part of our commitment being focused Question. on ending hallway health care, can the minister expand on how Ontario health teams will help bring an end to hallway health care? Thank you. Again, Minister to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Once fully operational, Ontario health teams will contribute to ending hallway health care by making it easier for Ontarians to move through the health care system. This will help ensure that those patients who are ready to leave hospital can do so hopefully at home with the supports and services that they need. And by better connecting hospitals and primary care providers with community-based supports, they will help to ensure that people receive the right care in the right place. Speaker, I would like to thank all of our health care partners for their enthusiasm, partnership and dedication to working together to provide Ontario patients and families with the best quality connected health care. There is still a lot of work to be done, but we are confident that all of us working together will be able to provide all Ontarians with the excellent quality care that they expect and deserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, yesterday, we learned that this government's reckless cuts are leaving a $5 billion hole when it comes to health care and education in order to pay for a tax cut for the highest income earners in the province. So, to be perfectly clear, the Premier is setting aside money to pay for a tax cut for the rich. Everyday families will get just $18, $18, while wealthy people will get well over $1,000 a year. Wow. So my question is simple. Uh, why does the Premier want to give away thousands of dollars to his wealthy friends while gutting services for everyone else? The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister, the members, Minister of Finance. Members, please take their seats. The question has been referred to the Minister of Finance. The House will come to order. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member for, uh, for that question. Mr. Speaker, um, as I've said before today in this legislature, we're investing in critical services. We're investing $1.9 billion more in health care, $1.2 billion more in education. But, Mr. Speaker, I've also talked about balancing those three priorities. Yes, we'll invest in critical services. Yes, we'll balance the budget. But we think that one of the best things that we can do for working Ontarians is put money back in their pockets. So we are not um, you know, afraid to debate in this House and stand in this House and talk about the $3 billion, Mr. Speaker, that we've put back into the pockets of Ontarians through the low income tax credit, through the child care tax credit, through getting rid of the cap and trade carbon tax. These are all things that we believe are supporting uh, the affordability issues, and we can balance all three. We're not a single issue party. We can do three things at once. How about you? Order. The supplementary question. Well, I appreciate the minister's snark this morning. What I have here is a very serious question. So back to the premier. Sure. On top of blowing a hole in our budget, reckless cuts will mean fewer services, fewer frontline workers like teachers, and more kids in crumbling schools. It'll mean even longer waits to see nurses and doctors, and it does nothing, absolutely nothing, to fix hallway health care. In fact, it will make it worse. Everyday families are going to get further and further behind while well, this government continues to take things from bad to worse. So, Speaker, do you really think that everyday families should foot the bill to pay for a tax break for the wealthiest among us? Again, the Minister of Finance to reply. Mr. Speaker, $27 billion for improvements in health care infrastructure. $27 billion that the NDP voted against. Oh, Mr. Speaker, $1.9 billion more for frontline health care just this year. Mr. Speaker, again, that, and I'm hoping on third reading perhaps the NDP will vote for, but until they now vote it against. Mr. Speaker, we are putting more money into the vital services they're concerned about. But, Mr. Speaker, we're also dedicated to balancing the budget because that's important. And, Mr. Speaker, we're also dedicating to putting more money back into the pockets of Ontarians. We won't apologize for it. It's good for Ontario, it's good for our province, good for our economy, and we'll keep it up. Next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, 
As a member of a riding with a large agricultural community, I always hear from my local farmers about how hard they work to ensure they are maintaining safe practices at work. Our province relies on our farmers to be able to provide us with some of the safest food in the world on a daily basis. Yet, I have unfortunately heard stories about how farmers can sometimes feel that they are not safe when on the farm due to people trespassing onto their properties, particularly over the last year. Farmers in my riding and across the province are eager to have a government that supports them, their industry, and is willing to listen to their concerns. Speaker, could the minister please inform the House about how our government is acting on the concerns of our farmers? The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant for the great question. Absolutely. Excellent. Mr. Speaker, last week I was proud to introduce the Security from Trespass and Protecting Food Safety Act, and I'm glad that second reading of the bill will begin later today. No one in Ontario should ever feel unsafe in their homes and at work. For the vast majority of our farmers, their home and their place of work, they are no different. If passed, Bill 156 would keep Ontario farmers, their families, agri-food workers and farm animals safe by reducing the likelihood of trespassing on farms and processing facilities. Mr. Speaker, if our farmers are to provide us with some of the best and safest food in the world, it is important that we support them and make sure they have the tools to maintain a high level of biosecurity. And if Fox. it is passed, that is what Bill 156 will do. And thank you very here, here. much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. Mr. Speaker, I'm glad that the minister mentioned biosecurity because I think all of us in the legislature support the idea of having practices in place that keep our farm animals safe and healthy, whether you work on a farm, whether you're a veterinarian, or a livestock transporter. I was glad to be part of an announcement back in September where Soil Solutions Plus, a small business out in St. George in Brantford Brant, was receiving a grant of over $15,000 to install equipment to power wash their vehicles to reduce the risk of spreading disease when driving between farms. This is just another example of how our farmers and workers in the agricultural sector make sure that our farm animals are safe. Animal safety and welfare is a top priority for our government, and I appreciate the work being done to maintain animal welfare Question. and health at the highest standards. Could the minister explain in further detail how Bill 156 will do this? Minister. Thank you very much again, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the supplementary question. Our government has always been deeply committed to animal welfare. Trespassers may not realize how their actions could lead to the introduction of disease among livestock and provide them with undue stress in the process. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, I want to make this point very clear. Anyone who suspects animal abuse should immediately call the authorities and report it. Animal cruelty is a serious issue, and I'm proud that our government has zero tolerance approach to animal abuse. If passed, our legislation would strike the right balance and ensure protection for farmers as well as their animals and the integrity of Ontario's food supply. In addition, it would, along with the recently passed PAWS Act, mean that Ontario would have some of the strongest animal welfare laws in Canada. Response. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank, you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Last June, the Premier proudly unveiled that he would be appointing experts, including the former PC party president and a lacrosse-playing friend of Dean French's son, as agents general earning big bucks. Pardon me, Speaker. I would very much like my question be directed to and answered by the Premier. Speaker, the Premier had to quickly fire two of the agents generals days after they received their appointments. Yet the other two are still collecting pay. Speaker, can the Premier update us on the work they're doing on location in Dallas and Chicago? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Economic Development. To the Minister of Economic Thank Development, Job much. Creation uh, and Trade. Very order. I'm very pleased to uh, update uh, this House on the progress, uh, Speaker. We have 15 international trade and investment offices around the world that raise the commercial profile of Ontario. Now, I can tell you in my direct experience with these uh, men and women across uh, India and across uh, Korea and across 
Japan. We had tremendous success. These are people who have huge expertise, helped us put the deal together with VVDN Technologies, for instance, which is hiring 200-plus engineers in the, in the Kitchener-Waterloo area. That was an exciting announcement that came after months of engagement by our staff uh, throughout the world. This was one of the results. As I said in the legislature yesterday, uh, we had another tremendous result with the Korean Importers Association, 8,000-plus members. Response. $535 billion worth of trade, and we're now having, through our new members, we now have access to those markets. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. As much as I appreciate hearing about India, Japan, and Korea, I asked about Dallas in Chicago, in North America, if the uh, minister is not aware of where these jurisdictions are. Speaker, Order. since June the 20th of this year, former PC Party president Jag Bodwal has been collecting $165,000 a year as Ontario's Agents General in Dallas. Uh, yet on November 26, he was here in Toronto joining the Ford cabinet at an event celebrating PC women in politics. And last October, Conservative Party activists were proudly uh, taking photos with the Dallas Agents General as he campaigned with them in Brampton. Uh, Speaker, can the Premier explain why the party's insider he's paying $165,000 to represent Ontario in Dallas seems question. to spend so much time campaigning for the Conservatives here in the GTA? Reply. Thank you, Speaker. We're committed to ensuring that Ontario is open for business, open for jobs, and open for trade, and, and quite frankly, open for trade with the U.S. Order. It's one of our essential economies. There's no stronger trading partner, Speaker, to Ontario than the United States. In 2018, two-way trade between our jurisdictions was valued at $390 billion. Wow. We're the top trading partner with 19 states and number two with, with nine other states. The Premier has been leading this in Order. a great way, Speaker. With ongoing trade uncertainty, we need trade representatives. We need extensive experience. And I can tell you, Speaker, that uh, we have been doing a remarkable job with the United States, with our trade in the United States. Uh, when you think about $390 billion, that uh, Ohio, one Bonds. of the number one trading partners that we have, we do more business with Ohio than we do with uh, several other countries combined, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Oh, great, Minister. Most of us know the Minister's passion for sport. We've heard her champion the Ottawa Red Blacks and the Ottawa 67s right here in the legislature, but some may not be aware of her support for amateur sport. While Sport is an important division of the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. She still finds time to coach a local hockey team in the PN. Supporting amateur athlete, athletics is important to me as well. In my riding of Peterborough Kawartha, we recently celebrated the 17-time national lacrosse champion Peter La Peterborough Lacrosse. Say, sorry, Peterborough Lakers. <laughs> Can the minister tell us? How our government has helped not only lacrosse players, but all amateur athletes across Ontario. The Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Speaker, I want to uh, obviously say thank you to the member from Peterborough Kawartha for being a steadfast advocate for his constituency and for the Peterborough Lakers. And I would be remiss on behalf of this entire House uh, not to say thank you to our three-peat Man Cup champions, the Peterborough Lakers. We all congratulate them for uh, the national uh, win that they brought to this assembly. Uh, the Ontario a lacrosse association received over $200,000 in annual funding last year as a designated provincial sport organization, and that contributes to 170 teams and 22,000 lacrosse players across the province of Ontario. The Ontario Lacrosse Association is also a recipient of the Quest for Gold. All members of this assembly should be aware that we have an Ontario Athlete Assistant Program, which supports 18 top-ranked provincial athletes in direct financial assistance to cover training and living costs. And over the years, in 2018-19, these athletes received over $4,100 and given some changes to the Man Cup as a national designated trophy, it is now eligible in the Ontario Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries for sport hosting events. Thank you. Much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for his support of amateur sport across the province. Every day in my riding, I see how amateur sports unites communities, creates lifelong friendships and helps develop our youth. 
As a supporter of amateur sport myself, specifically hockey, I founded the Under the Law Hockey Tournament, served as the president of the Peterborough Community Church Hockey League, organized Hockey Day in Canada in Peterborough, and chaired the Special Hockey International event. Speaker, I know that the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries is well versed in the benefits of amateur sport and what they offer for the development of our future community leaders. Can the minister tell us how the ministry's investment in amateur sport pays dividend for all of us? Minister to reply. And I want to say thank you to him for stepping up to the plate and being a volunteer um, with, the, with the Hockey Association. I spent the entire weekend uh, this past weekend coaching myself and enjoyed that, obviously. Ontario has invested over $27 million directly to support athletes wow. and provincial sport organizations across the province. When we hear names like Bianca Andrescu, Penny Alexiak, and Andre Degas, we know that we have invested directly into them through not only the PSOs, but also through the Canadian Sport Institute of Ontario in Scarborough, where we recently just invested $8.1 million, and to Coaches Ontario, which we invested $1.1 million. Mr. Speaker, in Ontario, we are not only providing a great deal of uh, recreational support, but we are also making sure that our athletes right here in Ontario are topping podiums, not just in Canada, but around the world. Response. In Ontario, we're open for business, we're open for jobs, and we're open for athletes. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. We are losing autism services in the North. Diagnostic capacity is decreasing. Children and their families have waited long enough, and thanks to this government's cuts, service providers are laying off staff and discontinuing services, something this government knew would happen but did it anyway. Meanwhile, this government says they won't do anything to help until maybe next April. Northern families cannot wait. Adriana Atkins from Manitouage, who is here today, must travel with her son 400 kilometers to Thunder Bay for services he needs. Adriana needs our help now and not next year. When is this government going to fix the problems it created for Northern families? The Premier. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks uh, very much uh, to the member opposite for the question, and uh, and thanks to the families actually who have travelled down from more, now northern Ontario to uh, to be with us here today, uh, Mr. Speaker. We're taking this issue very seriously. I can tell you that uh, for the last 30 years, governments of all stripes in this legislature have not gotten the autism file right. And that's why we've taken the time over the summer uh, to ensure that, uh, first of all, I went out and met with uh, a lot of the families who are here in the north, in Kenora and in Thunder Bay and in Sault Ste. Marie and Sudbury and also in North Bay, Mr. Speaker, just a few of the stops over the summer. But while I was doing that in conjunction um, with that tour and meeting with families face-to-face, -face, Mr. Speaker, our Ontario Autism Panel was meeting throughout the summer. They've made well over 100 Spons. recommendations, Mr. Speaker. We're working extremely hard to implement all of the recommendations that that panel has made, Mr. Speaker, so that we can have an autism program to be proud of. You know. Thank you very much. The supplementary question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. The North is in crisis, Premier. The government's cuts have been devastating for families of children with autism in the North. Service capacity that took decades to build has been decimated in less than a year under this government. Providers like Child Community Resources in Sudbury have had to let go of staff and discontinue services. Speaker, this was the only provider for French-speaking children in Sudbury and in the riding of Nickel Belt. Children and families are now left waiting because there's nowhere to spend the money they receive for treatment, and those are the lucky ones that receive any support at all. The North cannot wait until April 2020. We need a needs-based system now. Premier. How much longer will families be forced to wait to get help for their kids? Minister. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président, et merci uh, de le député opposé pour la question. Thank you very much for the uh, question from the uh, uh, member. 
families that are here, and I know they're meeting with uh, some of my staff a little bit later on today to talk about uh, the rollout of the Ontario Autism Program and how that's going to be occurring over the coming weeks and months, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I just want to let them know that we fully understand the situation in the north, Order. and we have been in constant communication with those service providers, those agencies that are actually going to be helping their children get the services that they need. I can tell you that my staff have been working extremely hard in the ministry and in the department, Mr. Speaker, to take those over 100 recommendations and then figure out how we're going to implement those, Mr. Speaker, so that, first of all, we do have a truly needs-based program, Spons. one that's there for the families when they need it, and one that's bigger than it's ever been, Mr. Speaker, a $600 million budget. That's twice the amount that Order. was invested by the previous government, Mr. Speaker. It's going to be a great program. Thank you very much. The member for Aurora, Oak Ridges. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Last week, the Minister introduced our government's plan to strengthen consumer protect protection for the people of Ontario at home, online, and in our communities. A key component of this plan is to introduce changes to new home warranties in the province. I know that many of my constituents and Ontarians across the province are eager to hear more about our government's plans to take action on reforming Tarion. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please tell this House and the home buyers across Ontario what they can expect from the legislation you introduced last week? Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Aurora, Oak Ridges, and Richmond Hill for this important question because, Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to tell the people of Ontario that after years and years of inaction by the former Liberal government, we actually are finally going to have a new warranty program here in Ontario. Yes, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, we listened and we have taken action and the wait is over. I think the member from Humber River, Black Creek, put it quite well a few days ago when he sa said the Liberals failed new home buyers in this province by taking no meaningful action on Tarion reform. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're just not reforming Tarion. We're absolutely overhauling it, and we are going to be pulling together and working with our stakeholders to de deliver Spons. a new home warranty program. And we're going to be following the findings of the Auditor General as well as Justin C Justice Cunningham, and we are taking into consideration the priorities that we heard in the consultation. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. So, Speaker, I want to thank the Minister for her answer, her leadership, and for bringing change to this province that, quite frankly, was long overdue. <laughs> so, Speaker, I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that this legislation comes just over one month after the Auditor General announced her recommendations to reform new home warranties in Ontario. The minister has shown the people of Ontario that our government is a champion of new home, buy home buyers who have been wronged by bad actors. Would the minister please explain to this House and to the people of Ontario what actions our government is taking in the Restoring Consumer Confidence Act that will improve the new home warranty system in Ontario? Minister. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the member from Aurora, Richmond Hill, and Oak Ridges uh, is absolutely right because we are absolutely a champion and we're standing with new homeowners because we are overhauling the governance structure and we're increasing government oversight once and for all. We're also going to improve the warranty claim process so that it's fair for consumers and timely. Our plan also includes increased oversight of the home building process so that Ontarians can move into their new homes without worrying about defects. Buying a home is the largest investment an Ontarian uh, can make in their lifetime, and that's why our government found that it was important to bring swift changes in that will ensure effective oversight of new home warranty programs and curb the influence of builders Spons. because Ontarians can confidently move forward with our government under the leadership of Premier Ford and our entire caucus because the investment in a new home is so, so important. And once Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Recently, tenants at 25 Montgomery Avenue in Eglinton Lawrence were faced with a drastic rent increase between 10 and 15 percent. 
This building is owned by Rockport Group, the same developer that tried to hike up rents by 25 per cent at 22 John Street. These tenants, like many across the province, are in new buildings that are no longer protected by rent control because of the rent control loophole created by this government. How can the Premier turn a blind eye to all of these tenants who are being gouged with double-digit rent increases because of a rent control loophole that you created? Questions have been addressed to the Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs. Referred to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And, uh, Order. Thanks, uh, thank you. For the question, uh, yesterday we, uh, we had uh, downstairs an, uh, an advocacy day uh, at Queen's Park by uh, rental housing providers from all across this province. There. I appreciate um, the fact that members from all parties attended that advocacy day, including uh, the opposition House Leader, who I actually agree uh, with uh, some of his comments. He uh, talked about the need for uh, landlords to be able to to make a fair uh, return on their investment. So I appreciate the comments of the uh, opposition House Leader. I also appreciate the question from uh, the member opposite, and I do appreciate the fact of the system. We uh, know better than anyone as a government that we need to have a fair system uh, and create a fair system for both uh, landlords uh, and tenants. That's why uh, we uh, kept our promise to uh, maintain uh, rent control for existing uh, tenants, but we also uh, made a commitment as a government to create more housing supply, and I'll have more. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And respectfully to the minister, what you've effectively created is two classes of tenants in Ontario: those with rent control and those without. Right. Rents across this province are out of control, and every day working people simply cannot afford the cost of a one-bedroom apartment in cities like Toronto. Last week, I introduced legislation that would restore rent control to all rental units in Ontario, closing the rent control loophole that this Premier created. Will the Premier finally see the damage that he has caused and support my bill that would restore protections for tenants that this government has cut? Minister again to reply. Well, well, Speaker, quite frankly, since our announcement last November to exempt new units from rent control, we've seen exactly what our government promised, and that's more purpose-built rental right. being built in this province. Uh, you know, Speaker, we decided as a government that we were going to tackle the housing supply. That's why we tabled our More Homes, More Choice, Ontario's Housing Supply Action Plan. But, Speaker, don't take it from me. Take it from the gentleman who was here yesterday that all parties uh, met with in terms of advocacy for rental housing provi providers. I'm going to quote Tony Irwin, president and CEO of the Federation of Rental Housing Providers of Ontario. Here is his quote. This NDP proposed policy change, what would be the third change in three years, serves as a disincentive to boosting investor confidence and bringing the desperately needed supply to the market. We are now at the highest level of GTA rental starts in almost three decades. Here, here. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 138, an act to implement budget measures and to enact, amend and repeal various statutes. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
going to ask the members to please take their seats. On December 9, 2019, Mr. Phillips moved third reading of Bill 138, an act to implement budget measures and to enact, amend, and repeal various statutes. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Bethlehem Falls. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Hardeman. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Sarkaria. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller. Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller. Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Ostrow. Mr. Ostrow. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Tanny Gas. Mr. Tanny Gas. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Baver. Mr. Baver. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Kusendova. Ms. Kusendova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Cara Hollyo. Mrs. Cara Hollyo. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Guzzetto. Mr. Guzzetto. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Ms. Tranthophilopoulos. Tranthophilopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Bauma. Mr. Smith, Peter Brokworth. Mr. Smith, Peter Brokworth. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Kanapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Branton Center. Ms. Singh Branton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Shubi Song. Shubi Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natashek. Mr. Natashek. Mr. Tavins. Mr. Tavins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Sherbourg Gwen. Sherbourg Gwen. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Rokosovic. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. The ayes are 65, the nays are 38. The ayes being 65 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, twice every election would be put in the law. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled as in the motion. Order. We have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 132, an act to reduce burdens on people and businesses by enacting, amending, and repealing various acts and revoking various regulations. Call in the members. This is another five-minute bell. On December 5, 2019, Mr. Sarkaria moved third reading of Bill 132, an act to reduce burdens on people and businesses by enacting, amending, and repealing various acts and revoking various regulations. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time 
and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Sartorius. Mr. Sartorius. Mr. Lester. Mr. Lester. Mr. Lester. Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Mulroney. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Smith Bay of Quincy. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Rickford. Mr. Rickford. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Parsa. Mr. Parsa. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Midas. Ms. Midas. Mr. Tanny Gasol. Mr. Tanny Gasol. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Babbard. Mr. Babbard. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Cazetto. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartz. Mr. Smith Peterborough Quartz. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Gamari. Mr. Mr. Tenega, Mr. Kenapathy. Mr. Kenapathy. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Madam Jelena. Madam Jelena. Ms. Singh Brampton Senate. Ms. Singh Brampton Senate. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Shubi Song. Ms. Shubi Song. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Stiles. Ms. Stiles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bogwan. Mr. Bogwan. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Ms. Morris. Ms. Morris. Mr. Rakosa. Mr. Rakosa. Mr. Harden. Mr. Harden. Mr. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mademoiselle Samar. Mademoiselle Samar. The ayes are 65, the nays are 38. The ayes being 65 and the nays being 38, I declare the motion carried. Be it resolved that the bill do now pass and be entitled in the, as in the motion. It concludes our business for this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.